man. So you can imagine what's up with Jacob now. He's, he's freaking out. I mean, we have, when we read the Bible, you've got to read it with, you know, like it's a movie, like you're in it, you know. So Jacob responded, blah, blah. No, he was freaking out, man. He was so scared to get on this journey. Years later, now God asked him to get back on this journey. And 500 men, his brothers, 500 men are coming against him. What does he have to defend himself? A bunch of cows, shepherds, you know. Nothing else he's got. So obviously he freaks. So what he does now is he kind of strategizes like what we would do. When a big circumstance kind of hit us, we strategize. First of all, he went to God. It's a good guy. But what he did was he reminded God of his obligation. You know, God, remember you said that he would be kind to me. Right? So after that, he strategizes how do we solve this problem. So he split his camp into two. Thinking that if uh, Esau would attack one, at least the other one would be safe. And then he gathered a huge amount of uh, livestock and a few servants and told them, much ahead of us. And uh, give this as gifts to Esau. Trying to melt the heart of Esau, right? So he sends them off. And he tries to rest that night. And he can't rest. He's in distress. Try having 500 men coming after you. You can't sleep. So he wakes up. He can't sleep. And he's thinking, oh my goodness, I, I've, I've done as much as I could. But uh, he wanted to be alone. So he told both his camps to move over to the other side of the river. So he was alone now. Alone in his camp at night. That is when his God moment happens. If you can read in uh, next slide. Two slides down. One more. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that that hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So pause there, don't read the punchline yet. Right? The punchline is later. <laughs> so what happened now is, strangely, this this, there's a man who walks into the camp in the middle of the night and starts to bash Jacob up, all right? And if you read through the scriptures, you'll know that Jacob is not a soft fella. He's worked the fields. He's a tough fella. So he starts fighting with this man as well. The last thing you need when you're in distress is a man coming and fighting you. So they're both wrestling with each other and fighting, but he recognizes this man as God. This man is later defined as God himself. God himself is wrestling Jacob. So Jacob now begins to wrestle with this man till daybreak. So how does this apply to us? Sometimes in our life, we are going about doing about our duties, doing the whole church thing, the whole connect group thing, just doing what God wants us to do, being a good father. You know, everything seems to be running smoothly, but you know, we live in a broken world, so life happens. And sometimes a big circumstance comes against us. And we get stressed out and we are distressed. And then we begin to wrestle with the things of God. We begin to wrestle with the disciplines and our, our Christian uh, beliefs, our Christian characteristics. We begin to wrestle with those. Let me give you an example. Let's lose, use finances as an example, okay? It's the easiest. Everybody can relate to this. I work for an NGO. The first thing that uh, donors do, we, we, we rely on fully on donors, on donations and on government grants, right, to run our organization. So the first thing that happens when an economic problem hits a country, it affects, firstly, their giving. The giving drops. The grants stop coming in. The donors stop giving money. When we are hit with a financial issue, just imagine going through everything, uh, doing everything right, and then a financial is issue hits us. I mean, you don't have to be rich or poor to have a financial issue in this world. It doesn't matter how much investments you have, the only person who can secure your bank account is God himself. So when a financial, when, not if, when a financial distress hits us, the first thing we do, most people, is cut on our giving. If we don't cut on our tidings, there are some people who will strongly discipline, I will not cut on my tidings. But the weekly offerings kind of, you know, the offerings where above your tiding kind of reduces to 60% or 40%, right? And then on that month, somebody comes to you and says, hey, you know, I've got this family who's uh, poor, you know, they're really living on the edge, they can't afford food. Could we, you know, do something, let's help them out? And we go, oh man, if you came last month, you know, we could have done something, but this month, it's a little bit tight, maybe next month. You know, we kind of cut. The first thing we cut, no matter how holy you are, is our giving. 
And that's where, and that's the, 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 the thing that God asks us to do. God told us to never neglect our giving. Do not neglect our tithing. God told us to be generous. God told us to feed the poor. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Giving is the characteristic of God. It is our Christian principle. It is our Christian practice. Our Christian discipline. But when we, hit, we, are, we are hit with a financial issue, we find ourselves wrestling with these exact disciplines. We find ourselves struggling with these disciplines, with, this, with the things of God, just as Jacob did. You see, whenever God gives us or puts us in a situation, He gives us the ability to win. In the, in the case of Jacob, if you read from verse 25, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, overpower Jacob, it's not that God was weaker than Jacob. I mean, if you read later, he touched Jacob's hip and his hip was dislocated. He's a powerful man, okay? It wasn't that he was weaker than Jacob, but God gives us the ability to win. Whenever we are put in a situation that is overwhelming, God gives us the ability to win. The problem why we don't get our breakthrough is because we surrender or retire before our time. We decide to quit before our time. What was Jacob's response? And the reason, the core reason why we surrender before our time is because when we are in distress and we are messed up, the first thing we do is blame God rather than recognizing it as a God moment. Yeah. We blame God. We, rec we think it's from the devil. We think, oh my goodness, the devil is attacking me and God's doing nothing about it. That's the first thing that comes to our mind. And then we end up quitting and throwing in the towel and blaming God, getting angry with him. When we are supposed to recognize that, when we are in distress, it's not of the devil. God allowed it to happen. Nothing comes by, comes to, <laughs> comes by God as a surprise, right? When we are in distress, a situation that challenges our Christian principles, recognize it as a God moment. He recognized it as a God moment. That's why he responded, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob, no matter how things looked for him, no matter how bad things looked for him, no matter how painful it was for him, he dislocated and stuff, no matter how tired he was till daybreak they were fighting, no matter how bad and how big the opponent was, he did not let go. He was determined. He didn't let go of the things of God. He didn't stop giving. He didn't, st didn't stop tithing. He didn't stop attending church. He didn't stop going for connect groups. He didn't stop leading people. He didn't stop reaching people. He didn't stop the worship team. He didn't stop worshiping God. He didn't stop praising God. He didn't stop reaching out to people and uh, his colleagues and people around him. He never stopped the things of God. He was determined and held on to the things of God. And because of that, his right response, when he recognized it as a God moment, he responded well, he was launched to the next level. Let's see how he was launched to the next level. So what happened the next day is, Esau reaches, right? And then Esau runs towards Jacob. Can you imagine Jacob now? Hip is dislocated. He can't, already he couldn't run away. He's, he's probably, oh my goodness, I, this fellow wrestled me, I'm tired. And then my brother is coming again. He's running towards Jacob. Now, we read it funny because, you know, we see the end of the story. In his situation, all he knows is Esau wants to kill him. 500 men have reached. He wrestled a man all night long. His hip is gone. He doesn't know what to do, right? He's fearing for his family and everything. Esau runs to him and instead of stabbing him, he kisses him. And they both kiss each other. And they welcome each other back to each other's family. And they miss each other. It's, a, it's very dramatic if you read the scriptures, right? <laughs> And Esau welcomes his brother back. That wasn't just, that was the victory to his issue, right? He had an issue, an overpowering issue that happened to him, and he got his victory. So whenever God puts us in a situation, the victory, if we respond correctly, by holding on to the things of God, the victory is inevitable. Jacob didn't have to take up a sword. Jacob didn't have to make a speech. He didn't have to do nothing. Esau kissed him. Without Jacob even moving forward. He didn't have to do a thing. God fights our battles right. when we hang on to the things of God. Right. But what happened after that? The victory is cool. That's cool. But he was launched to the next level. Why I say that? Because after this, God meets with Jacob and God says, Jacob, I will not leave you until I have given you everything that I have promised you. 
and your forefather Abraham, that your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. He was launched to the next level. It's found here. Then the man, the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Israel. Thousands of years later, the nation is still called Israel. They still honor that night. The Jews don't eat the hip region of any animal as an honor of what happened that night. This guy was launched to the next level, right? So first God moment, one slide up, bro. The first God moment we need to look out for and recognize it as a God moment when, that when we are in distress and that stress causes us to struggle with the things of God, causes us to struggle with our principles and practice of, a Christian, of our Christian walk, recognize it as a God moment. And the only way to respond well, because if you miss it and you respond wrongly, we're not going to be launched to the next level. But if you respond well, we'll get our breakthrough, but we'll also be launched to the next level. The response is only determination and holding on to the things of God. Amen? Are you getting something today? Yeah. All right. So let's go to the second character that we're going to look at. This character is one of my favorites in the Bible because he's messed up and he's done lots of messed up things. I kind of identify with him. You know, he's a broken man. His name is David. David is the youngest son of Jesse. He is a shepherd boy. According to scholars, he's probably around 12, 13, 14 years of age, right? So he's a young fellow. He's got brothers, elder brothers, and they're all in Saul's army. Who is Saul? Saul was the king of Israel at the time, right? So King Saul, uh, yeah, he was the king of Israel, and his brothers, David's brothers, was in the army. And during this time, his whole story is found in, uh, of his God moment is in 1 Samuel 17. Same thing, we're not going to read through the scripture. During this time in 1 Samuel 17 was the time of war. It was the time where the Philistines were going to attack uh, Israel, right? And the Philistines were a powerful army. And uh, the Philistines had a champion named Goliath. So you all know the story, right? Goliath, but you've got to imagine Goliath now, right? He's not just some big fella. He's an overgrown punk, okay? He's ugly, he's strong, he's nasty, he's smelly, and he's beasty. And he's this monstrous monster of a man. And he comes out to the Israel army and he says, if any one of you dares to fight me, instead of fighting one whole army, come on, let's reason out. One on one, find your best warrior, fight with me. Winner takes it all. Not a single person in the Israel army dared to stand up against him. So this goes on for 40 days and 40 nights. What happens now in one, one of the days, when that, the, the day that the armies were supposed to meet on common ground and begin their fight, their battle, right? That's the day Jesse sends out David. David was taking care of his sheep as usual. Jesse tells David, why don't you take some food and give to your brothers who are in the ranks? And also kind of to get a letter from them or find out what's happening and come and let me know. Because, you know, those days they didn't have CNN to tell us that Russia walked into Crimea and stuff, you know. So the, he didn't know what's going on in his country. So he needed a report. So he told, sends David. So David goes out now. Imagine this young fella carrying some food. And he goes out into the ranks. And at that time, the ranks are marching against each other. And while the ranks are marching against each other... Goliath comes out and does his thing. He shouts and the whole Israel army runs back to where they came from. So David is, what is going on? I thought this is the army of God. I thought this is the nation of God. Why are you guys running away? And he's going around and bugging, pulling their, their whatever shields and whatever. Hey, hey, why are you running away from this fella? Can you imagine nobody's going to give him any attention? Because small nitwit of a boy... We are warriors, man. We are fighters. We've been fighting battles and wars before you were born. And he's going and asking. So eventually, story reaches Saul. Saul calls for David. And King Saul asks David, what, what is it you're looking for? So David is furious. Something within David clicked or, or engulfed and uh, consumed him so much that he needed to do something about it. He couldn't stand the abuse 
Goliath was giving his people. He couldn't stand the injustice that was right in front of him. He couldn't stand the bullying. But even though he was just a boy, David wasn't trained for better. He was far from qualified to carry a sword. He was not equipped. No way he was equipped. But something within him consumed him so much that he had to do something about it. So you know the story. He eventually goes out, uses what he has, and he kills Goliath and all. The, army, the Philistine army surrenders, right? But what happened with David is, David recognized that, that that feeling that he had, that thing that consumed him in his heart, that caused him to do something, that feeling, that desire to fight against injustice was put in his heart by God. How does this apply to us? How many of you, now this is going to be a little bit controversial because a lot of us are very comfortable with our lives and we don't like to kind of, you know, get out of our routine and mess up our schedule a little bit. So let me ask you, how many of us have seen an image or a video or read a news somewhere about some form of injustice or abuse lately? Can I see your hands? How did it make you feel? Did it mess up your whole day? Did it kind of consume? Let me give you an example. I read a news... It's it's still messing me up. I read the news a few days ago uh, in South Sudan about uh, this nine-month-old preg nine pregnant woman being gang raped, right? Brutally gang raped, and then she, because according to the Sharia law, she's at fault. And uh, now she is sentenced to be stoned publicly to death. A nine, uh, it, 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 just, it just messes people up, right? And uh, a few stories I read uh, last week as well, also in Syria, in Damascus, you know, the whole war thing is going on there. And uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the uh, jihadis or whatever, gone into this Christian town, crucified young people for, for not wanting to deny Christ. They didn't want to give up Christ and, uh, and convert. So they were crucified in front of their parents. They made their parents watch. And the younger children had their heads cut off and the soldiers played football with their heads. Now that's messed up. I didn't see the images of it, thank God. But you know, you know what I'm talking about. When you read stories like this, or when you see an image or watch a video of such injustice and abuse, it consumes you. It just messes you up. But who am I? I'm just a small young fella in Klang. What can I do about the situation in Sudan? I can't do nothing. So the most I can do is say a little prayer. Try not to read the news again, not talk about it again, and probably, hopefully, by tomorrow afternoon, I can have my lunch again and carry on with life. And that's the one thing we miss, because we must like, realize, like David, he realized that that feeling, the thing that consumes you, was put there by God, because you were supposed to do something about it. The feeling when you walk past a homeless man and you have this overwhelming feeling to do something about it, but we don't want to mess up our schedule. That feeling was put there. That desire to fight against injustice, that desire to stand up for what's right was put there by God. No matter how unequipped we are, how unqualified or untrained we are. David knew his God. His only response in 1 Samuel 17 verse 37 was, when, he, when Saul asked him, are you sure you're, you're going to do this? He said, the same God that delivered me from the paw of the bear and the lion. You see, while taking care of sheep, he's messed up some bears and lions for coming at his sheep with his hands. But he didn't credit that to his hands and his ability. He knew he couldn't do nothing. He knew he was not qualified. But he knew his God who, gave, who put that desire in his heart would qualify him for the task that he wanted him to do. He said, the same God that delivered me from the paw of the bear and the lion will deliver me from this Philistine. He knew his God. So that's, that's the thing, that, that's why he caused, it caused him to do what he did. Back in 1997, Pastor Joe preached, this me preached a message don't worry, it's not like I'm Superman and I remember his message. No, I do not remember his message. But that was my first year in church. First year, uh, I don't know, experiencing Jesus and everything. And there was one thing he said that has caught my attention. 
and has stayed in my heart, sunk in deep into my spirit. I don't know if, the, if he's the original one who said it or if it's someone else he said and he quoted. But whatever it is, this phrase that he said stuck in my spirit till today. It made me move to where I am today. He said this, God, let me get it right. God does not choose the equipped. He equips the chosen. I say it again. God does not choose the qualified. He qualifies the chosen. Me right here, this, doing this, if you know me personally, you will know that this is not possible. It is not possible that I can be standing here talking to you. I'm a very low uh, self-esteem kind of guy. I am not a public speaker. I don't that is not, if you may think it's my gift, it is not my gift. I have never had, never thought of it, never dreamed of it, never wanted it. <laughs> it's not something I can do. It's not something, I, I, getting through college wasn't something I could do. Working where I'm working is not something I can do. Being a father is, no, not in my wildest dreams. <laughs> Being a husband, never. Never, not in my wildest dreams. There's no way I could have done what, I could, what I'm doing now, what I've done throughout my years. If it wasn't for God, if it wasn't for this phrase, knowing that God, if he calls me to it, he will take me through it. Knowing that God qualifies the chosen. I am far from qualified to do this. I am far from equipped or trained. I never went to Bible school, nothing. It's he who qualifies who he chooses. And I thank God today that he chose me for whatever it is that he make me do, uh, makes me do. And he has chosen you. Not one or few, not a few are chosen. All are chosen. Yeah. Not, not all are chosen to be full-time ministers, but all of you are chosen for a specific task. Right. And when he calls you for it, it's usually, if not all the time, out of your ability. You cannot do it on your own. You need to rely on his equipment, not your qualification. It's different from a job. In your, in your workplace, you've got to hand in a resume of what, you can do and what are your abilities and your qualifications before you get the job in the kingdom of God he gives you the job and on the job he trains you for it and he gives you what you need to to achieve it and that's the difference and that is what David understood I'm gonna tell you a short story about about trust and faith here have you heard of the wheelbarrow story I don't know if you've heard it before sorry so there was this guy back in the 70s so he he tied uh, a tightrope, is it what you call it? A tightrope, the thing that you walk on top. A tightrope from one end of the Niagara Falls to the other end. He's got a whole crowd now gathered and he's got a camera crew and news crew and journalists and everything getting ready for his, his uh, magnificent act. He said, I'm going to walk from this end of the tightrope to that end and back throughout the Niagara Falls, right? And so he, he asked the crowd, how many of you believe I can do it? Everybody says, yes, you can do it. How many of you have faith that I can walk then back on that tightrope without dying? Everybody said, yes, we have faith, you can do it. So he did it. He went across and came back. And then now he does something even more crazy. He takes a wheelbarrow, fills it with rocks and stones and debris. And he says, now how many of you believe I can push this wheelbarrow through go uh, throughout the, the, the across the Niagara Falls and back on this tight rope. How many of you believe that I can do it? And everybody went, yeah, we believe you can do it. How many of you have faith that I can do it? Yeah, hey, you can do it, everybody. Not a single person denied that he couldn't do it, uh, that he could do it. Then what he did next was crazy. Instead of walking the tight rope with a wheelbarrow, he threw out all the garbage that was in that wheelbarrow, all the bricks and all the stones, all the debris. And he said, okay, now, can I ask for a volunteer to sit in this wheelbarrow as I take you across and back? Crowd went silent, ran, some ran for their life, news cameras turned off. This is not possible. It speaks of how we are sometimes with God. Lord, I know you can do it. I believe, yes, Jesus, the breakthrough finances you will bring. Yes, and God says, get on the wheelbarrow. Wait, <laughs> no, 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 no. You take the wheelbarrow and go. I know you can do it, but I'm not going to get on the wheelbarrow. Pastor's message a few weeks ago, faith equals to risk. Trusting God is getting on the wheelbarrow and letting him push you across. That is, that is faith. Not just God, I believe you can do it. Come on. 
you need to get on the wheelbarrow. What David did was, he got on the wheelbarrow. He knew God could do it. He believed God could do it. But he got on the wheelbarrow, went and stood in front of Goliath with his slingshot and five stones when everybody thought he was a madman. And he achieved what he's supposed to achieve. So second God moment. Next slide. Second God moment. Uh, yeah. The desire to respond to injustice or abuse, though it's beyond our qualification, training, or ability. Recognize it the next time you get the desire. But it's, oh, I don't know what to do. Do it. The response is step out in faith and to fully place our trust in God, getting on the wheelbarrow. What did David achieve by doing this? How was he launched to the next level because he responded correctly to a God moment in his life? Well, firstly, he won Goliath, right? And the Philistine army defeated. So again, he didn't have to fight his battle. God did his fighting for him. That stone couldn't have killed that big giant. It's God who magnified that stone into the giant's head, right? But what happened to David next is he's beca he became... He was launched to the next level, all right? He became the greatest king Israel has ever known. That's number one. Number two, till today, the star of David is flown on the Israel flag. Till today. And what else? What else could it, How much more far level could David be launched to? Well, Jesus was called at one point the son of David because he comes from the Leon. Uh, uh, Joseph comes from the lineage of David. What a privilege. If he did not fight that giant that day, he'd be thought, no, I'm just too small. I'm going to go back to what I do best, taking care of sheep. I don't think we'll be here talking about him. Or talking. <laughs> right? Next. Third character we're going to look at in the New Testament. Short story, but very good story. Mary. The mother of Jesus. What happened with her? So she is a young, engaged virgin, right? She's a young woman. She's probably about 16, 17, again, based on scholars' studies. And she's engaged to be married to this hunk of a man named Joseph. Probably was a hunk of a man, you know. Those days they all work out, not, not like me, <laughs> right? So Joseph was engaged to get married to Mary. And one day Mary was praying. And then what happened was this angel, Gabriel, comes up in front of Mary and he says, Mary, Mary, you are going to be pregnant. Can you imagine Mary now? Okay, she, she probably said, uh, uh, no, no, no. I think you're mistaken. She's in that house. I, I'm a virgin. I'm, I'm a virgin, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm a virgin. I'm, I'm a godly woman. And the, and the angel said, no, Mary, don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're going to carry uh, this child. You're going to name him Jesus and he's going to be the savior of the world and blah, 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 blah. This is overwhelming stuff. Okay? Do you think she just stood there? Or, yeah, okay, cool. I'm sure you would have messed up her mind. I mean, if I was in that situation, I mean, well, if one of you women were in that situation, if I was in that situation, it would be a little bit more impossible. It is the most physically impossible thing. It is the most naturally impossible thing. Can you imagine how the society would have treated her after this. Because, you see, it was a small town. Everybody was probably invited for the wedding. And now when she goes out with a baby bump, she's going to be the talk of every auntie's dinner, I'm telling you. Every auntie is going to be talking about, did you hear about that Mary? You know? <laughs> Nobody's going to believe that whole, I mean, we read it now. So we know the virgin birth happened. Then, they, it never, has never happened before. And I know Pastor Joe has said it a million times, but I'll say it again because there are young ladies in the house. It will never happen again. <laughs> right? So now, imagine the trauma she would have gone through socially. Her social connections would have been destroyed. Her friends would have been embarrassed because back in the day, this was really, it's still taboo. But back in the day, this was taboo, taboo. Right? It's, it's friends would leave you kind of taboo, right? And imagine her going and telling her husband-to-be, Joseph. Yo, Joseph, uh, so it's all good, but uh, I'm pregnant, <laughs> right? But don't worry about it. I'm a virgin, <laughs> right? So, so I'm sure Jacob would have went, oh, that sounds like fun. Eh? Let's do it. No, I, 
I mean, in fact, the Bible talks about it. It says that Jake, uh, Jacob, Joseph was so distressed about it, he was going to call off the wedding. The angel, angel Gabriel had to show up in Joseph's house and tell Joseph that, hey, brother, don't worry, it is God. Only then he went ahead with this, right? How does this apply to us? Ah, this is an, a bit difficult, right? Because I know some of us have had a wonderful testimonies i've heard of our church members wonderful testimonies of having a real you know like a a, a physical uh, what do you call that appearance of jesus in their house or a, or a, a dream a, a vision of something so great uh, an audible voice of god you know i've, I've not experienced all these are probably once or twice maybe the audible voice of god and stuff but all these are really really physically impossible manifestations of god it's not it's not that it never happens it does because it happened in the past, it'll happen today, it's the same God, right? But, uh, but because we live in a world that's so natural, when we have such an encounter, we don't recognize it as a God moment, we, we brush it off our shoulders as, you know, you know, desert sun too hot, you know, so, ooh, ooh, an angel, not possible, it was a mirage or something. You know, it's just, it's not possible. I had an experience once, and for this, if it, is, it, is it recorded? I can just stop for a while? Because, because I'm going to be talking a little bit about my organization supposed to do. In Luke chapter 1 verse 38, this was Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant. I am willing to accept whatever he wants. May everything you have said about me come true. That is unconditional obedience. The only way to respond when God challenges us in a physically, naturally impossible task is unconditional response. Straight from spirit to God. Take out the brain for that part. Because if you put the brain in during that part, we will not respond this way. And we will miss the greatest opportunity of experiencing His supernatural power. I have taken that opportunity the next time I learn from a mistake. And I won't share the whole story now because it's too long. But I have seen healing take place and I was shocked. I couldn't believe. I, I didn't believe that would happen. I didn't even have to say a prayer. I didn't even have to pray. I just had to obey. I just obeyed and stepped out before I could pray. Oh, the pain is gone. Really? I, I, but I haven't said anything. I had a whole prayer, you know, <laughs> kind of written down the formula and stuff. It's because all he wants is unconditional obedience. Let's not miss out a moment like that. In Mark chapter 16, verse 17 to 18, God said, And these signs shall follow them that believe, not just pastors, teachers, them that believe. Yeah. How many believers in the house can I see your hands? Them that believe that they will cast out demons in my name, that they will raise the dead, that they will, that they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. God moment number three. When it's a physically, naturally impossible moment, recognize it as a God moment. The only way to respond is unconditional obedience. Last character we're going to look at today. His name is Simon of Cyrene. Most of us don't really read about him because there's really nothing about him in the Bible, but just one verse in each of the Gospels, right? So we usually kind of brush through, don't even recognize his existence. He was the guy who helped Jesus carry the cross from a certain point right up to Golgotha where he was crucified. Uh, a few of the Gospels talk about him, but only in Mark he's mentioned a little bit more. But that's it, nothing else ever is said about him. So based on... Because he was mentioned in the Bible, people did study on him, right? Studied about why was Simon of Cyrene so specifically mentioned in the Bible. And so, based on scholar studies and everything, uh, they, uh, firstly, Cyrene, where is Cyrene? Cyrene is modern day Libya, right? So, if you've got your map, if you can remember the atlas a little bit, if you can't, later go home and Google it. Libya is not like next to Jerusalem, it's, it's different, right? So, Libya. Uh, to Jerusalem, uh, Cyrene to Jerusalem back in the day, riding on camels, maybe two horsepower camel or whatever, two camel power camel, right? <laughs> it takes approximately 45 days, uh, approximately, 
to reach from Cyrene to Jerusalem. So in John chapter 19, it kind of says uh, a little bit, it mentions a little bit that Jesus' crucifixion was done on the preparation day for the Passover festival. The Passover festival was happening in Jerusalem and uh, going to happen at that time. So Simon was, was from a Jewish, small Jewish communi community in Cyrene. He, he's probably now on his way to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. So the Passover festival for those who live nearby will probably be a yearly thing and not, you know, there's a lot of things to study about the Passover festival, a lot of uh, rituals that the Jewish people do. Uh, but Simon, for Simon, it was probably a once in a lifetime thing. It was like a pilgrimage thing, right? Uh, the purpose, you know, probably to meet God, to have an encounter with God at this Passover festival. And uh, so it probably would have cost a lot of money, you can imagine, 48 days traveling, uh, camel food and all that. So it's gonna cost some money. And he was traveling with his two sons. Uh, not sure if the wife was there, it wasn't mentioned. He also probably had to take a long leave from his job, right? Because the festival would last a, a week or so, I think. And then uh, another 48 days to get back and stuff like that. And there was also a few things that Jewish people needed to observe before participating in the festival. Uh, one of the things, a lot of things, but one of the things uh, that uh, caught my attention was that they, they, they are not allowed to be unclean, touching blood and stuff like that for a year or something like that before uh, participating. So you need to be, remain clean, not, cannot touch blood and stuff like that, right? So now Simon is, has arrived in Jerusalem and there's crowds of people in Jerusalem and there's a commotion going on because the whole crucifixion thing is going on. Now we read it today and we think, wow, blessed is Simon picked up the cross of Jesus and helped him. He didn't know who Jesus was. He probably have heard of this rabbi, you know, being far away, he probably have heard of this teacher, this great uh, prophet or whatever. He didn't know the guy who was getting crucified that day was Jesus. He, he had no idea he was on his journey and he, now he reached, like I said, they didn't have CNN back in the day, right? So they reach, he reaches there and he kind of moves through the crowd to kind of see what's happening. In his own mind, this seems like he recognizes the process because he knows the Roman rule. He knows that the crucifixion is uh, reserved for the worst kind of criminal. So he, he probably, wow, the criminals are getting crucified today. And out of the blue, the Roman soldier comes, you carry the cross, come and help this man and whips him and forces, forces Simon to carry the cross. He didn't go, oh, such a privilege to carry the cross of Jesus. Oh, so amazing, Lord, is your love for me. No, he didn't know who he was. To him, this was a common scum, a criminal. And he's getting messed up now. His, his schedule is ruined. He's going to, he carries that the cross, blood is on him. He can't participate now. His savings that he spent is just wasted. His leave from his job is gone. He's just... Can you imagine how furious he is? He's just messed up, angry, frustrated, forced to do something that he doesn't like, doesn't want, didn't plan to do. But that was his God moment. From that point of time when he picks up the cross right up to Golgotha, nothing ever is mentioned about him again. But I don't believe that you can get an encounter, such a close encounter with Jesus Christ on that day and he went home the same. He, he had the touch of Jesus carrying that cross. Do you think he went home the same? For those of you who know what I'm talking about, one touch, that's all he needed. Not the preaching, not the music, no, nothing drew you to God. Just one touch. The one touch and it blew your mind and you are here today. It blew your mind and that's what made you give your life to Christ. Carrying the cross up to Golgotha would have changed Simon's life completely. Would have launched him to the next level and the scripture to prove it. Again, nothing much is mentioned about Simon, right? So you can't really read about him. But in Acts, in the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit falls on a group of people and they become the early church, the beginning of the church, right? The beginning of the church. These are weeks after, this happened weeks after Jesus' resurrection. So the whole Simon thing is done. Resur Jesus died, then the resurrection. And weeks later in the book of Acts, Simon, uh, Cyrene is never mentioned previously until this day, Simon of Cyrene. 
And then in the book of Acts, among all the different, different tribes of the Jewish people that were attending and waiting for the Holy Spirit, one of the tribes, one of the communities was Cyrene. I think, I believe, Simon Feller had something to do with it. Because he did the only thing he knew what to do, the only thing we are called to do, to be witness. He would have went home on his two horsepower camel right away and said, you know what? I just met God. I went to Jerusalem to meet God and meet God I did. Face to face, I have met Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. That's all he needed to say. I bet he had something to do with Cyrene being there on the day of Pentecost. Not only that, in Romans 16, Paul writes a letter to the Roman Empire because now the Roman Empire, the, the early church now is starting in Rome, the early Christian uh, mo uh, movement is starting in Rome now. And Paul writes a letter to the Roman uh, uh, leaders, right? And he mentions this guy named Rufus. Simon was known as the father of Alexander and Rufus, only mentioned in Mark. You see, um, throughout the Bible, you are usually identified by your father. So it's usually Isaac, son of Jacob, you know. It's not, you're not identified by your sons, you're identified by your father. But Simon, in this case, Mark writes it in a way that he's identified by his sons. Simon, the father, we don't know who's his father, but we know Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. So Rufus now is mentioned in this letter. No mention of which Rufus is he talking about, but based on study and Bible scholars, that, that this Rufus could be, could be, I'm not saying it's a fact, it could be the brother of Alexander, the son of Simon. Because I, I mean, they have witnessed Jesus as well. It wasn't just Simon. They witnessed their father's moment, God moment, and they would have went home being, doing what they do best, being witnesses. And when, uh, when Paul mentions Rufus in that letter, it's indicating either Rufus was a member of the official Roman government, highly unlikely because he's a Jew, or the more likely one, he was a member, a notable member of the early church in Rome. He probably could have been one of the leaders of the early church in Rome. We don't know. We don't know, there's no, no, no proof about it, but I'd like to believe Simon's encounter by carrying that cross for Jesus sparked a huge thing that we read about today in the book of Acts and in Romans. God moment number four. Sometimes this is also controversial. We feel that responsibilities are forced on us. Sometimes we feel that, my goodness, who is... Is he to force me to come for connect group? Who are they to force me to go to attend a, a church? Who is he to force me to lead a connect group? We get angry when things seem, seemed forced on us. Sometimes even forced on us with bad intentions. But it's forced on us, godly things I'm talking about. And it's forced on us. Oh my goodness, you will worship lead today. Ah, this fellow is forcing me. Stefan, how can he force me to worship lead? Who is he? I get angry. I'm so angry. I don't like the people of the church. There's no love. I'm so angry. I get angry with God. So I want to leave church and go to another church. Maybe a different God is there. And then, you know, we get messed up because it... It causes inconvenience to our schedule, not part of our plan. It messes up everything. But let me just uh, share with you a testimony. Years ago, there was somebody who forced me to do something I never wanted to do, never thought of doing. I just like coming to church, listening to music, sitting at the back, feeling a little bit goosebumps and going back. Pastor Stella says, you are going to lead a connect group, a uh, cell group back in the day. It's a Tamil speaking cell group. I can't even speak Tamil. Oh, don't worry, you can speak Malay. Malay is my second language. I can't do it in my first language. How am I going to do it in my second language? It's not possible. Nope, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And uh, one week passed, and you all know Pastor Clarence. All I know is he was in front of my house, honing, hey, why are you late? Late for what? Leaders' meeting. Why? I'm not a leader. Yes, come. Oh, okay, I'm in leaders' meeting. Reach leaders' meeting. Materials are handed out to me. What, what is this? I didn't say yes to nothing. Material, so yeah, just go through this and don't worry, you'll start it next week. Next week? What? All I know is next week I'm there 
and this bunch of kids are there and I'm supposed to lead them and I'm still denying, nope, I'm not doing it and I just find myself going through the book and then years gone by, I've been a connect leader. I was forced into that situation. I was forced, seemed forced into that position. But I thank you today, Pastor, because if it wasn't for that, that was the breaking point, that was the starting point in my spiritual walk. If I did not uh, submit to authority, the only reason why I said yes later on was because my parents raised me well, raised me to submit to authority. And I recognized the authority of the senior pastors. I, I submitted to their authority. And I can't tell you, I can't, I can't even imagine, I can't even begin to tell you how that has launched me to a different level in my life. Right. If I did not do if I did not submit to authority, authority that day, I guarantee you I will not be where I am today. I know for a fact that the day when I submitted to authority, and it, it didn't just happen once, it happened many times. Because when we reach the next level, that is not it. Every time you reach a level, that is a training for the next level. And every new level you reach, it's a training for the next level and the next level and the next level. Oh, yeah. And sometimes you will be forced to do things that you don't want to do. But without being forced, come on. Let me tell you something, church. You cannot, you cannot say, I will, when I'm ready, I will serve. You will never be ready. I guarantee you when you're yeah. dead, you still won't be ready. You will never ever be ready. Because as I said earlier, he equips the chosen. You will never be qualified. You will never be ready. You just have got to do it. And sometimes, yeah. even with bad intentions, because we have, I've, I've, I've met people before, oh, I don't want to do it. You know why? Because I know what their intentions are. So what? Who cares what their intentions are? Do you know that this is a God moment? That God is putting, I mean, biblically, right? You follow the Bible. I mean, if your leaders are telling you, go and bomb somebody, you don't know, I'm going to submit to authority and bomb somebody. <laughs> you know? Biblically, if, if your leaders are telling you, you need to lead people, huh? that's the Bible. You need to heal somebody. That's the Bible. No, I'm not going to do it because their intentions are wrong. So what the Bible says it. Base your trust on the Bible. In Romans chapter 13, verse 1, it says this. Let everyone be subject to authority, for there is no authority except that which God has established. I thank God I submitted to authority that day because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I am. Simon of Cyrene, his God moment was forced on him with bad intentions because I'm telling you the Roman soldiers didn't go, shall we give this boy a chance to carry the cross, you know? Maybe, maybe he'll get to meet God along the way to go, oh, let's help him, poor fellow. You know, years later, they'll talk about him, so nice. <laughs> the Roman soldiers didn't give a hoot who he was. They didn't know his name. They just forced him to do what he, what he did. He could have ran away, but his submission to authority launched him to the next level. Wow. In his life, in his walk with God, in his, in his testimony. It didn't just affect him. It affected a whole community. And communities after that. Just a recap, if you can have the band up. Just a recap. First God moment. Recognize this as your God moment. If you are serious about moving to the next level, I'm serious about God moving this church to the next level, but the church consists of people. And if people are not going to be moved to the next level, the church is not going to be moved to the next level. Right. So people, you and I, me and you, we are going to need to move to the next level. And if you are serious about moving into the next season, next level, then we got to recognize our God moment. God moment number one, when we find ourselves in distress, struggling with the practices of our Christian faith, of our walk with God, our only response is determination and holding on stronger to the things of God. God moment number two, the desire, whenever we feel the desire to respond to injustice or abuse, though it's beyond our qualification, ability or training, the only response is to get on the wheelbarrow, step out in faith and trust God. God moment number three, when the moment that God gives you, a task that God gives you is physically impossible, physically, naturally impossible, recognize it as a God moment. Again, biblically, check with the word of God. Biblically, recognize it as a God moment and your only response to be launched into the next level, unconditional obedience. And finally, 
when your God moment is forced upon you, when it is forced even with bad intentions, recognize the authority behind that intentions. It is God. Again, checking with the word of God. Your only response, submission to authority. God moments are not going to be easy. God moments are scary because God moments requires faith. Not that I believe you can do it. Faith will risk faith. The jumping on board, the wheelbarrow kind of faith. Every God moment will be beyond your ability. Every God moment will be beyond our qualification. Every God moment, everything that God wants us to do will be beyond us because we have to rely on Him. He wants us to rely on Him because only He can do it. Without God, we can do nothing. With God, all things are possible. So every God moment is going to be scary. Every God moment is going to be crazy. It's not going to fit in your brain. It's not going to work with you when you analyze with it. But it's got to be done in order to be launched to the next level. And that is why we need this leading of the Holy Spirit. We need God to lead us. Moses said, I will not go unless, you're, unless you go with me. We will not move God unless you move with me. Amen. That's it. It's all.